Ever load into a crowded subway car only to instantly regret it because now you find your face buried into someone's <coughs> armpit? If you have, you might think to yourself, there's got to be another way to do this. And it turns out there is. There's a design that's been proven to solve overcrowding, but we kind of ignore it. Passenger trains have come a long way. They first got their start with miners hitching rides in coal cars on their way to work. But the first passenger rail carriages were introduced in the early 1800s, and they were very uncomfortable, impractical, and sometimes even dangerous. Passengers rode both inside the coach and on benches mounted onto the top of the coach. By 1834, mounted carriages were replaced by rectangular rail cars. They featured simple wooden benches and had a center aisle, similar to what we have today. And for the most part, train cars were self-contained, meaning that going from car to car was hard and not permitted. Look at cities like Chicago, New York, and Boston, and you'll find commuters jam-packed into train cars. Some commuter or long distance rail cars are wider and less crowded, but subways are constricted by their tunnels and are often narrow. There are only so many seating configurations that you can give people. There's bench seating along the wall and then periodically uh, two pairs of opposing seats will stick out at a 90 degree angle. But the most efficient arrangement, and which is what they've gone back to today uniformly, is bench seating along either wall. And you had that from the very beginning. Essentially, train cars haven't changed much in over 100 years. Even though this exists, this is an open gangway car. Gangways are narrow walkways or platforms that provide access between two points. In this case, two train cars. Have you ever seen an articulated bus? You know that black accordion section in the middle? That's what we're talking about. The enclosed space between cars allows riders to safely spread out between crowded and uncrowded cars, increasing the train's capacity without adding any length. Replacing the unused space of traditional train cars with open gangway cars can represent up to a 14% reduction in crowding, which is what makes open gangways so appealing. London already operates open gangway trains on its subsurface lines, and they found the design could increase the capacity of its deep tube by as much as 10%. London is also replacing its 1970s trains on the Piccadilly line with open gangway trains, which should be completed by 2025. New York City is adding open gangway cars, even if it's at a snail's pace. In 2018, the MTA approved the purchase of 535 R211 train cars from Kawasaki, including 20 trains featuring the open gangway design. And it's good timing. New York City's subway ridership is increasing as we come out of the pandemic reaching 3.7 million trips a day, up 35% from last year. Prior to the pandemic, ridership was hovering around 5.5 million trips per day, so we'll need all the space we can get. So why don't we see more open gangway trains in the US? It's estimated that at least three quarters of metro systems outside of the US use at least some form of open gangway train cars. These trains can be taken for a spin in older systems in Paris and London, as well as through newer networks in China, Algeria, and Egypt. They're clearly the train car of the future. That's at least what the world is suggesting by their implementation. But I guess America didn't get the message. While we don't have a fleet of open gangway train cars in the US yet, they may be right around the corner. Cities like New York and San Francisco are currently testing these train cars out. So while we don't have them yet, we may see these trains popping up sooner than we thought.